Hi. Okay, welcome everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, we have <clears throat> a, a very, very uh, special conversation and we'll be having it in person in this room. It's also being live streamed on YouTube and will be recorded uh, in case you didn't take all the notes that you wanted. Uh, we're at Brown University today, uh, and it's a, it's a good day. It's not raining yet, but it's also midterm day. So a lot of students, I gave my own midterm this morning, a lot of students are getting in and out of their exams right now. So uh, today, a, a joint effort uh, with IBIS and the Watson Institute um, uh, and the Taubman Center within the Watson Institute are all joining together to bring um, Dominic Erdurzain, right, Erdurzain? That's great. Um, who has written a book that has already caught fire, uh, been receiving a tremendous amount of publicity and press and excellent reviews. So we're really pleased to have him speaking in person today. We do have the book, um, and it's technically for sale. But in fact, uh, we've set it up so that if you want to make a, a contribution via Venmo, um, a $15 contribution, that's great. If you can't, that's also OK. Uh, and, um, um, uh, Dominic will be available to sign the book for you after the conclusion of the talk. We also invite you to a short reception after the talk. So, so we will, so we will be um, uh, asking our speaker to speak for about 35 minutes. Then we'll have Q and A, open floor, and then we'll have informal conversation after that at the reception. So, Dominic Erdozain uh, is currently a research fellow at Emory University. He studied um, uh, modern history at Oxford and earned his MPhil and his PhD at Cambridge University. He lectured at King's College London for several years before moving to Atlanta, where he is currently researching the history and culture of firearms in the United States. He's going to present uh, a talk on his most recent book, uh, One Nation Under Guns, How Gun Culture Distorts Our History and Threatens Our Democracy. Um, an in-depth review is available at the New York Times uh, um, website. And in that website, um, it became an editor's choice almost immediately, and the book is uh, called Brilliant and Gut-Wrenching. Um, so we'll proceed uh, in terms of Q&A with, um, um, <clears throat> and I, I am bad at uh, pronunciation, but I'm going to get this correct, I think. Aiva, you want to tell me how to pronounce your first name, your last name? Yeah, but you said it differently. Okay. Professor Aiva? You said it differently. Yusinita. Yusinite, yeah. All right, okay. We'll be uh, starting off the question and answer period and moderating questions and answers. So when you have a question, please come up to the podium, the microphone's there, uh, so that everybody can hear the question and it will be successfully recorded. So without further ado, um, we're very, uh, very excited to welcome Dr. Dominic Erdozin uh, to speak about um, One Nation Under Guns. Well, thank you very much. And thank you for that introduction. Um, it's an absolute pleasure and honor to be here. You know, when, when you write a book like this, you get a lot of correspondence. Um, and obviously this was one of the nicer ones. Um, one day I was taking a pounding on Twitter, wave after wave of hostility, and then finally, my spirits lifted when a message came through saying, wow, congratulations, you deserve a Pulitzer Prize for fiction. Uh, to borrow a phrase from my favorite Western, the big country, if there's one thing I admire more than a loyal friend, it's a devoted enemy. Today I want to consider what it means for scholars to engage in public debate and more specifically make the case for history as a resource against a formidable and seemingly immovable gun culture. I know people who say that we cease to be scholars when we step into the scorched terrain of the culture wars. Some of them are my best friends. And I'm here to try to prove them wrong. I mean, the classic critique in my profession is of history is Herbert Butterfield, who says that studying the past with one eye on the present is the source of all the sins and sophistries in historical writing. So there's a danger of distortion, and there's a danger of moralism. And I get that. But I also think we wouldn't be human if we didn't have an emotional response to the world around us or a desire to engage it intellectually. And although historians typically recoil from this work, I think history has got a contribution to make, especially when the, the, the topic at hand, the problem at hand, gun culture, has been so aggressive in its appeals to the past. So 
really as a cameo, I want to take as my model uh, and hold up a, as an example of, of this approach, the British historian and anti-war campaigner, E.P. Thompson, who's an icon of the historical profession and a man who never quite knew the difference between a lecture and a peace protest. This was a man who stood before the crowds at the Glastonbury Music Festival in England and read poems by William Blake, um, a man who pioneered the, his the principle of history from below, defining the craft as the work of rescuing ordinary people from, quote, the enormous condescension of posterity. History for Thompson was about recovering lost voices, releasing their energies into a complacent and imperious present. The historian, he said, is, is above all a witness, a witness to, to something different. We are historians, he said, because we know that the past is not dead, inert, and confining, but is strong with energies that can be brought once again to our side. In Beyond the Cold War, a scintillating lecture of 1982, which was originally intended to be a high-profile BBC broadcast, and then they, they cancelled it at the last minute when they realised how, how he was going to criticise NATO. Um, but in this lecture, Thompson brought the weight of his erudition to bear on the madness of the nuclear arms race and the inertia of those who'd come to accept it as a permanent reality. Nuclear weapons and an obligation to hate communists are not iron laws of history, reasoned Thompson. They're negotiable, they're negotiable phenomena that begin to shrink when you understand how they came about. What is the Cold War now about, he asked. It's about itself, he concluded. It was a conflagration without a cause, a self-consuming fire. Americans were nervously investing in nuclear weapons to destroy a murderous foe that was in fact being supplied and fed by corn from the Midwest, a so-called enemy that was actually a vital trade partner of the United States. Most of all, Thompson magnified the contrast between the deathly postures of the warmongers and the sounds of reconciliation stirring on both sides of the Iron Curtain. The military is not the real, he protested. There are sentiments stronger than war. And within this ferment, he said, was a patriotism larger than nationhood. And that's where he uses this lovely phrase, the shape of hope. We are slowly learning to travel without maps, he said. We're beginning to recognize that the other is ourselves. It was a remarkable vision, and one that squares with recent scholarship on the Gorbachev era, the theory that Glasnost began with the poetry readings of the Leningrad underground, as one scholar has put it. Thompson's hope centered on his perspective and his sources, a certainty that a war that experts call permanent is in reality something brittle and contrived. Thompson's confidence as a peace activist grew from his clarity as a historian to see beyond, an ability to see beyond the canons of political orthodoxy and expediency. Which brings me back to guns. To expose something is not necessarily to arrest it. I think we know that, but it's a start. And when I moved to the US, I was almost as alarmed by the fatalism on firearms, the fatalism of liberals on firearms, as the reckless zeal of the right. And if there's one phrase that I could expect um, to hear when I discussed my project, it was, good luck with that. Um, guns are as old as the hills, people seem to say, um, as American as apple pie. And I just wasn't convinced. Um, even to think of the technology, quite apart from the question of gun rights or the entitlement to, to carry one outside the home, was to confront something startlingly new. So while eminent New York Times columnists were advising liberals to tread carefully on guns and to accept that we are, quote, destined to live in an ocean of firearms, I became increasingly uneasy, uneasy about this tone of capitulation and the historical assumptions behind them. Common sense was a phrase that began to trouble me, as did the suggestion that the project of gun control give way to the less abrasive goal of gun responsibility. Um, this narrative resurfaced after the Uvalde shooting a couple of years ago, you know, Matthew McConaughey, uh, the actor, saying, you know, it's time to move on from gun control because it offends people. Let's talk about gun responsibility. Um, and that's just the way the discourse is shifting. Um, we can talk more about um, you know, the, 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 the logic of that afterwards. You know, commentators sometimes refer to the gun debate, but to compare these columns with the kinds of protests 
penned by Molly Ivins or Tom Teepen, you know, a generation earlier, um, was to see that something vital has been lost. Our common sense, <clears throat> our common sense would be their nightmare. We now endure and in to some extent accept conditions of domestic armament unthinkable a generation ago. And to roll back the clock to the 60s and 70s, when submachine guns were virtually unknown and leading figures of both parties favored a total ban on handguns, was to see that we have been misled on the American heritage. You know, memories are short. So my E.P. Thompson moment came a few summers ago when I was working my way through a mountain of editorials written in the 60s, which I think was the last decade when America conducted a truly national debate on firearms. And the, the vigor of this writing really um, struck me with tremendous force. Stop calling them accidents. Stop talk, talking about tragedies, thundered the Washington Post. These are choices, political choices, and we have the power to change them. That's the kind of tone of that decade. When the National Rifle Association advised members to arm themselves against rioters in the cities, the newspapers called them out in language that we, we rarely see today. There was one piece, uh, an editorial in the American Rifleman, which is the house journal of the NRA, as, you've, as you may know. And um, it was advising, it was lamenting the fact that many citizens are, are reluctant to take a life, even to preserve their own, particularly women. And this just sent the Washington Post editor into orbit. He said, there is a savagery in this twaddle that is worse than irresponsible. You know, when reluctance to kill is described as a quirk to be overcome, um, when we're encouraged to arm ourselves against our fellow citizens, uh, democracy is on the brink. Um, it was time to talk seriously about disarming the nation. So um, this is arresting language compared to um, the, the language of, of compromise that I felt that was more typical of my contemporaries. And, and more than this, this outrage, it was the clarity with which someone like Ralph McGill, um, famous journalist based in Atlanta, it was the clarity with which people like McGill identified the racial dynamics buried in neutral terms like law and order and law-abiding citizens that really struck me. And that was the phrase as, a, as an outsider to this debate that really struck me. Um, the, the, the sanctity of the law-abiding citizen. Um, and people like McGill said, look, you know, guns are, are the white man's prerogative. It's clear. Guns are enforcers, not equalizers. You know, they cut through this rhetoric about peacemakers and equalizers. Um, and in one of his editorials, they violate the first principle of the, uh, of the liberal state, um, which is the surrender of deadly force uh, to the collective wisdom of the community. So now we're talking, I thought, this is the language of John Locke and the architects of the liberal state. Um, these sentiments were echoed by the authors of the, of the President's Violence Commission, which delivered its massive report in 1969, according to Patrick Charles's book, which came out last year, Vote Gun, which I'd recommend. Um, he suggests that um, the Violence Commission wanted to propose a total ban on ha handguns. Uh, Milton Eisenhower was the chair of that report, but it doesn't actually state that, but it, it's not far away. That's the language that's circulating in the late 60s and early 70s. Now, we know that that advice was rejected, um, and it's hard to imagine any newspaper today, even a liberal newspaper, right, you know, publishing a column calling for the total ban of, of handguns um, as a condition of democracy. But that is where academic freedom comes into play. Um, my E.P. Thompson sort of um, theme. That is where the university is a place of risk and open inquiry comes into its own. Here's another of my favorite quotes about history. The historian, writes Peter Burke, is the guardian of the awkward fact, the skeletons in the closet of social memory. Although that makes us strange, it is also what makes us relevant, paradoxically, perhaps even useful. The irony is that our only chance of influencing a public debate is to be situated outside it. Maybe that's one, another one to discuss. So in that spirit, I want to state very clearly my argument that the gun, sorry, very briefly, um, my argument that the gun culture as we know it um, is in contradiction with the values of democracy and um, the goals of the Constitution. You know, this modern idea of free and open access to deadly, deadly firepower is not just historically new, a departure from the legal norms of US history. It is a violation of the very principle of freedom as defined in, in the democratic tradition. Um, you know, it turns out that the founders, the very people who are invoked in support of gun rights, 
furnish a far more robust and coherent account of liberty than this kind of muscular freedom to go armed as and when you choose. And indeed, I don't think they could have enshrined an individual right to own a gun without owning their political philosophy, which is highly skeptical about passion and will and ego. Um, and, and really, that's my, my sort of first ground for hope, really, um, just the sense of the sophistication and the depth of the founder's philosophy. I feel like some of us have sort of surrendered them um, to one side of the debate, when actually to study them is to, to see that their ideas would be heavily critical of this sort of reckless individualism that, that is attached to gun rights at the moment. Um, gun culture, as we see it now, is, is really a culture of innocence and righteousness, that, 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 that I'm good and therefore I don't miss. I, I, I'm, you know, weapons are safe in my hands. Um, you know, this narrative of good guys and bad guys, law-abiding citizens and criminals. Um, and, you know, it's a virtue culture, this idea that only certain p kind of people are dangerous with guns. Um, you know, someone like Charlton Heston, a former, obviously, screen icon, but um, a um, former president of the NRA, he was perhaps the most vocal um, exponent of this sort of two kingdoms um, perspective, or, or Ronald Reagan um, famously speaking to the, the National Rifle Association in 1983. You know, they just are good guys and bad guys, and it's a nasty truth that you can't, you know, you can't engage with criminals. Um, so that's the idea that I found so, um, so dramatically, um, you know, such a, such a dramatic contrast with the, with the more realistic and skeptical um, psychology of the founders. Really, it's an anthropology, a theory of human nature that, that, that underpins their, their understandings of freedom. Crudely, um, people are dangerous. Men are dangerous and violent and vindictive and driven by pri pride. And you know, the, the liberal state is there to protect us not only from tyrannical rulers, but from the, the tyranny in all of us. You know, there's a phrase that John Locke uses in his second treatise on government. He says, you know, in the state of nature, this pre-political state, all men are equally kings. You know, this idea that kingship is a propensity of human nature, the desire to govern and rule and have your way. It's not just something that ends with the removal of a single king. Uh, one of the levelers, which is a, one of the radical groups who E.P. Thompson loved and, and inspired him, um, and he was, they were a big influence on the whole movement towards um, popular sovereignty and um, you know, forerunners of the US Constitution in many ways. One of them said, it's no good removing the name king it's the thing king that has to go, the thing, the concept of king that we all want to rule the world, so to speak, or at least to rule others. And that's the idea that I found fascinating and hadn't really been draw, brought out from many of the you know, excellent books on the Second Amendment, but books that don't actually engage the philosophy, this skeptical philosophy. The closest would be Bernard Balin's book on the, um, the ideology of the American Revolution. He, he sort of captures this realism very well. Um, so it's a sophisticated account of human nature that says, yes, people are created good and there is a natural dignity and a natural equality that must be preserved from uh, priestly hierarchies and, and monarchy. But we're all equally prone to our passions. We all have egos to some or other degree. You know, John Milton, the poet, puts this so well that, you know, we're free to if we're free to, to choose um, and to live um, to some extent on our own terms, we're also free to fail, free to fall. Um, so it's a much more dynamic account of human nature than, say, classical republicanism. This is a point really well brought out by Balin. You know, the classical republics did have this idea of virtue, um, a sort of almost a flatter view of human nature, whereas modern democracy is, is a bit more knowing about that propensity for violence. Um, one of my favorite quotes, you know, this is the whole 18th century, you know, Voltaire, you know, he says, you know, there is a natural law, but it's still more natural to forget it, you know, a natural law of conscience. Or Abigail Adams uh, writing to her husband saying, remember, you know, all men would be tyrants if they could. Um, you know, that's the first principle of political philosophy. Um, some of you may know the correspondence between John Adams and Thomas Jefferson in their old age. Fascinating letters, and in one of them, Jefferson is sort of, hammering away, you know, why are the Europeans at it again? There's war, there's violence, there's bloodshed. 
Um, whatever ha happens of reason and conscience. And Adams responds and says, well, you know, there are such things in the world as reason and conscience, but our passions possess so much overpowering eloquence and metaphysical subtlety that they convert our reason and our understanding to their party. So that's not to say there's a, there's a sort of mechanical dialectic between reason and emotion like we sometimes assume. It's to say that actually our emotions can claim our reason and we think we're acting rationally. And I just think there's a, there's a tremendous wisdom as well as a sophistication to this, this way of thinking. You know, Alexander Hamilton saying, look, just to, to calculate on virtue, to expect people to behave according to the principles of reason and justice is to calculate on the weaker springs of human nature. So these are not Calvinists saying that people are totally depraved and totally fallen. Just saying that there is virtue, but it's just not the stronger element of the human character. And, and you have to plan accordingly. Um, Tom Paine, the firebrand, you know, the, the London Times calls him Mad Tom, and they think of him as, as this sort of complete utopian radical. There he is saying, you know, were, were the impulses of conscience and reason clear? We wouldn't need any government. But they're not. People fail. Um, and government is the badge of lost innocence. It is reason where reason fails. Uh, and he, you know, even Jefferson, who's by far and away the most optimistic of the founders, you know, if, if there's a if there's an American Pangloss, so Pangloss is the character satirized by Voltaire in Candide as you know everything's for the best in this best of all possible worlds. Jefferson would be the closest to a Pangloss in terms of his optimistic outlook. But even he vigorously objects to the idea that. Um, virtue is going to be enough for people to behave properly. He says that his penal reforms were not based on the fantastical idea that people will be good. Um, he just wants to make the penal code less sanguinary, as he put it. So across the spectrum, there is this um, tremendous realism about human nature. And of course, I have to finish with my favorite quote from, from Madison in, in the Federalist Papers. You know, if men were angels, no government would be necessary. But we're not. We are not, not them, but us. We are, we are fallen. So this is not a generation that is desperate to arm individuals. And I think that's probably the, the heart of uh, my argument and what I think is potentially you know, original in this book. Um, and th you know, this is the idea behind the, the er elaborate checks and balances that define the American system. And it's the background to the whole idea that power always has to be dispersed, diffused, kept moving. You don't want concentrations of power at any point. Um, you need, as, as, as Je Adams puts it, you, know, you need wheels within wheels, this sort of mechanical image. Um, and it's the principle behind the well-regulated militia um, named in the Second Amendment. Um, well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. You know, this is no floating mandate to be appropriated by the individual. It's embedded and meshed in webs of reciprocity and legal obligation, not just a social duty you had to serve. It's like paying a tax. Um, it's embedded in an institution, the militia. Um, and again, what I found so interesting reading Locke and reading so many of these like state constitutions talking about um, the necessity of serving, and if you don't serve, you have to pay an equivalent or, or in kind, or, or some kind of service, and you have these elaborate arrangements for conscientious objection in most states. Um, it, it, what interested me was the use of the language of social contract, and there is a passage in Locke where he says, look, it's, you know, the power that we surrender to the state, the lethal, deadly power we surrender to the state, we then um, have to be willing to use in defense of the state, and that's really how we pay our way. We must pull our weight to, to maintain the security of all. And this is not only um, fair, it's just and necessary. So that's his kind of militia clause. And this language comes up again and again. This is not about individual rights to, 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 to own a gun. It's, it's a very different thing. And of course, the advantage of this model, although it's, you know doesn't work so well in, in practice, of course, um, is that everyone is safe. Everyone enjoys some protection within the community. And there is no need for a professional army. And this is the idea. You know, I wonder why it's so hard for modern Americans to understand um, this military rationale for the Second Amendment. Well, it's because now we're so adjusted to a professional army, to militarism. And this idea was rooted in the anti-militarism of the Republican tradition, the, 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 the view that most republics um, 
go the way of you know all flesh that the, the, um, the road to to tyranny is um, a professional army that allows rulers to rule as dictators and that's the threat that they're, they're so worried about in 1787 um, with a militia you can't fight a war of conquest you can't build an empire um, it's not unreasonable to say therefore that the second amendment is an anti-war measure because it's it's intended to protect the emergence of this modern um, massive army that could lead us down the way of Europe. This comes up again and again in the constitutional debate that nothing spells Europe and the old world um, than, than a military establishment. And that's what they want to avoid. So it's just so far away from what we've now got. You know, the individual right that's kind of read into this language, it's not a stretch, it's, it's a violation of, of what, the, of this principle of shared um, authority. Um, and there is a vast difference, as I'm sure anyone will, will recognize, between bearing arms in the service of the state under orders. You, know, you, you were subject to martial law when you served in the militia and carrying a weapon for personal use. So um, you can, that's the legal side of it, really. You know, some of you will know about the Heller decision of 2008, um, District of Columbia versus Heller, in which the Supreme Court found for the first time in its history that the Second Amendment protects an individual right to a, a gun. Well, there are so many methodological problems with it, but one of them is that there is so little evidence from the constitutional era, from the constitutional debate. Um, there's a sort of peeling back to 17th century English law and I think a misrepresentation of that. And then there's a leaning on the jurisprudence of slavery in the 19th century, because there really is very little to go on in the constitutional era. So you get this sort of cherry picking approach that leans awkwardly, um, outrageously in my opinion, on um, the jurisprudence of slavery. And that really brings me to my second main point, which is the anti-democratic roots of gun culture. Um, it's hard to describe this as a ground of hope, except in the kind of spirit of Sim Simone Weil, when she's reading you know, in her poem on the Iliad, she says it's a picture of loveliness. And it's, well, it's violent, but it tells the truth about violence. That's her, that's her thinking. Um, that there's something reassuringly um, stark and clear about the connection between guns and slavery um, in the 19th century. There's this quote from Samuel Colt, you know, the, the, the revolver is only invented in the 1830s or, or patented then. And there's this letter from Samuel Colt saying he's despairing of ever having a market for his revolver after the end of, uh, of one of the um, Indian wars that who's going to buy these things? Well, the South, primarily, um, and then the Civil War. We'll see the gun culture nationalized and expanding to some extent. But you know, this panic that who would want a revolver is very revealing. Um, slavery is the source. You know, the, 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 there was a case in 1846 in Georgia, my state, um, Nunvee's state, which, according to Antonin Scalia in the Heller decision, you know, this, this case perfectly captured the, the, the relationship between the first half of the Second Amendment and the second, you know, the military bit and the personal right. And, um, you know, scholars like Saul Cornell and others have shown emphatically that this was an outlier and it was peculiarly crafted to defend slavery. You know, guns were used in the South to hunt down runaway slaves. And to, Theodore Dwight Weld's book, um, 1838, I think, has page after page. I think my editor only allowed me to put four of these examples in the book. You know, it's sort of constant whittling down of what I thought was the most powerful material, really, in the book. Um, get, that off, get that off my chest. Um, but, the, but Dwight um, Weld publishes pages and pages of these ads just released in um, southern newspapers. You know, my runaway Caleb, my man Jacob, can be identified with these these, rifle, these wounds in arms, shoulders, legs, walks with a limp because of a gunshot wound. And um, people like Weld and people like Charles Sumner come along and say, this is the ghost of slavery. This is the nature of slavery. The fact that their argument against slavery was partly based on the fact that by encouraging it, you encourage an armed society. One of the most interesting sources while we're doing what you know, my wife calls Britsplaining is um, Charles Dickens' this book, his notes on America in 18, 1842. He, um, he's stunned by the violence of Southern congressmen. Some of you may know the book by Joanne Freeman, uh, Field of Blood, it's an excellent book. But she shows that most of it, nearly all of it, up to the mid-1850s when the Northerners finally um, give up almost, um, 
it's, it's all Southern. It's all slaveholders fighting, brawling, pulling out guns and bowie knives, threatening each other. And, and Dickens is obsessed with this phenomenon. Why do they do it? Well, he finds a simple explanation. All of these people are slaveholders. He said, we would be idiots to close our eyes to that fine mode, mode of training, as he puts it, um, that teaches people to govern those around them with force. And of course, this is going to spread from the plantation outwards. Um, Solomon Northup, you may know his book, 12 Years a Slave, uh, better known as a, as a Hollywood movie. Um, excellent film. Uh, Northup makes the same point because he's a, a New Yorker and a musician kidnapped to spend 12 years um, as a slave and far and away his worst experience is in Louisiana and he's stunned by the violence. He talks about the way slavery has made a race, a race of men brutified and reckless of human life. And then he makes the same point about the permeative nature. You know, some of you know the work of people like René Girard and this idea of the mimetic theory of violence, that we copy one another. That's why there probably is a book to be written on Hollywood and whatever. Um, popular culture, you know, that's a, that's a sort of NRA sort of meme as well, blame, blame Hollywood. But there probably is an argument to be made there. But um, Northup observes how the children on the plantation start copying their elders and whipping and threatening um, the enslaved people. And um, he, he points out that, it, that, that shootings that would bring instant and severe punishment in the North are just laughed at in the South. And in fact, they bring certain kinds of prestige. So I don't think there's any argument with the centrality of slavery in the making of this, um, you know, the legal history and in, in, in the creating a market for guns and the habituation to violence that is so necessary. You know, um, Sumner talks about this, the abolitionist Charles Sumner, who was viciously attacked himself by a slave owner. Um, he says, it's simple, you, know, you turn people into property and then you can shoot them. It's, it's, it's a simple connection. Um, the Civil War, as I've indicated, this is the very poignant bit because you then get this liberationist narrative for owning guns. The Civil War, as I've indicated, nationalizes gun culture to some extent. Um, it gives a, a new legitimacy to, to guns. Yeah. Um, certainly Colt's revolvers um, and you get this whole romanticism of people like Theodore Roosevelt and the romanticism of the frontier Frederick Jackson Turner Owen Wister who's the sort of the godfather of the western genre um, this is a sort of counter narrative in a way or a complementary narrative even here however race is the primary ingredient you know you get these poignant statements from Western towns saying, let's get rid of the guns. There is no excuse for carrying a gun in a civilized community unless you happen to be among barbarians, meaning Native Americans or, or blacks. And uh, you might know Herman Melville's famous chapter or section in the metaphysics of Indian hating. And it's a really interesting word, metaphysics, because he's saying it's not ethical. It's not based on what Native Americans do. It is what they are, that there is this clear cut distinction and we see this in the early 20th century when gun control starts to become a big issue, and it, as it was in the southern states in, in, in the early 19th century, and it was de facto in the northern states throughout that period. But when you get concentrations of populations in the cities and they have cheap cult revolvers, um, there is a great deal of gun violence. and as a really a bipartisan issue of the progressive era and the New Deal era, there is tremendous energy and will to control guns. You know, the, the, the pistol is the curse of America, said one statesman. Um, there were businessmen taking out ads in newspapers offering a prize of $1,000 for someone to give one good reason why handguns should be available to the public. You know, just get rid of them. There is this clarity there. Um, Tommy guns, you know, fully automatic weapons, um, are described as the paramount example of peacetime barbarism. Um, FDR, as governor of New York in 1931, says that a state that fails to take measures to, pre to prevent reckless shootings is, quote, out of step with modern thought. Why does it lose? I mean, I feel like I'm giving away the plot line, really, a bit of a spoiler. Um, but it's defeated by various forms of nativism and racially charged patriotism. The gun is, again, the white man's prerogative. Crime is dark and foreign. You get these extraordinary editorials in the American Rifleman 
you know, the house, you know, the, the, the NRA is really an adjunct of the government in many ways and, and has access to military surplus and is, is involved in training um, tr in, in all sorts of pro government sponsored programs of rifle training. But the NRA, in its own journal, is writing these articles saying that we all know that it's, it's the foreigner, it's foreign blood that is causing crime, and the native white stock is slow to anger, you know, this kind of biblical language of goodness and decency. And that's where the discourse of the honest citizen, and later the law-abiding citizen, um, develops. But it's really, you put it next to, next to publications of the Ku Klux Klan in the 20s, which was a mainstream organization, and it's hard to tell the difference. So it's coming out of that stable. The 60s is the big decade with the assassinations and tremendous um, unanimity for gun control. And then there's the shooting at the University of Texas in 1966. And a journalist for the Washington Post said, one act of political leadership could break the thrall of the gun in American life. This is the moment. And it fails. You know, the, the 1868 Gun Control Act is described by the Washington Post as a crimp in the mail-order gun business. Um, why does it fail? Well, <sighs> racial fear is, 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 is clearly... Um, on, on, it's clearly a factor. You know, Gary Wills writes about this as a young journalist, um, and he said he, he chides himself, he's embarrassed how long it took him to realize what the dynamics behind gun ownership really were and why people who would say to a pollster, I'm in favor of gun control, and then quietly go and buy a gun, why, they, why there is that double standard. So, um, and you, you know, you've got the Guns and Ammo magazine, which is even more radical, well, far more radical than American Rifleman, saying that in the long run, you know, these riots, deadly riots in, in Watts and in Detroit may be a blessing for us because they may help preserve our sacred right um, to bear arms. So it, it really is clearly um, racially um, motivated. Finally, um, my last point really is um, the culture war. It, in, 18, in 1970, Richard Hofstadter, the one of the finest historians of the 20th century, he writes this terrible lament, really, what went wrong? You know, if we can't control guns at a time of unique popular revulsion against them, you know, when are we going to do it? How far must things go? And it's painful now because the numbers were small. You know, you've got 24 million handguns in circulation then, and the aim is to reduce that down to 2.4 million within 10 years. And those are tiny numbers compared to the estimated 200 million now. And of course, the firepower that's handguns. Um, the firepower is so much greater. What, um, you know, how far must, must things go? Well, we now enter a new phase, which is really the culture war. Um, early 70s, you've got people like Richard Nixon, two of his attorney generals calling for a total ban on handguns, and, and this Justice Department report on controlling crime in 1972 calls for a total ban on handguns, with this lovely detail that even antique pistols are to be rendered inoperable. You, know, you could read it and weep, or you can take heart that you know, what we're dealing with is now very new, that, that um, most of these extremes can be dated to the Reagan era. Reagan is the person who opens the floodgates with this, abs this absolutist language of entitlement. Permitless, sorry, concealed weapons were controversial. Having to apply for a concealed weapon was controversial in the 80s and 90s and first decade of this century. And the argument was, was very much, you know, we are the responsible people, we go through the training, therefore, you know, you don't have to worry about misuse. Angela Stroud has written a really good book called Good Guys With Guns that, that cites this. And a friend of mine, um, Michael Gregoni, has done a fascinating doctoral study on this at Duke. But he was joking the other day, it's already out of date. All his anthropological research about people going through these training programs, it's, it's old hat because you don't need them now. My state has made it um, unnecessary, this permitless carriage. And, you know, one state in, uh, in the 1980s allowed permitless carriage, and that was Vermont. Now, uh, most states, more than 40, have either permitless or shall issue, i.e., no questions asked, legislation. It's a dramatic shift in American life. Assault ri rifles were extremely rare in the 80s. In the 90s, they, before the ban, they represented less than 1% of sales, and now they represent 25%. I could tell you so many stories from the South about people you would never imagine in the world would have an assault rifle, but do.
again, these, the, the, the astonishment of that period is something that does give me hope. You know, you've got people like this retired colonel saying, you know, what are they going to do with these weapons? Shoot down the trees? Do people know what the firepower is? You know, last week we had the Supreme Court discussing rather glibly, as you might think, um, the, these entitlements. I, I feel like we almost need the military expertise, the people who, who really know what these weapons do, to, to, to speak out on the subject. You know, it's beyond my comprehension, says one state attorney general, uh, that these weapons of war are available to private citizens. You know, the fact that these arguments were lost doesn't make them any, more, any less relevant. In fact, quite the opposite. You know, to say that the ship has sailed is just doesn't seem to me an acceptable uh, response to that. You know, in, in tolerating assault rifles, we are the outliers. And that, I think, is where you know, the bracing air of the past can wake us up. None of this is fated. Um, the brilliance of Thompson's Cold War lecture uh, was not just the dismantling of the rationale for weapons, it was the appeal to popular sovereignty, the latent energies of a worried people as the true agents of history. You, know, you have more power than you think, is his constant refrain. You know, we fail when we lower our sights to what is considered realistic. You know, if we've learned one thing from the civil rights movement, it's that what is realistic is whatever can be imagined. But we have to do that work. We have to think beyond the present, beyond the tyranny of now. The past is not dead, said the activist historian. It might just save our lives. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, um, Dr. Erdezain. So before we open the floor for questions, which I'm sure there will be plenty, I have a couple of my own and will use my uh, position as the, as the moderator to, to ask them. So, Should I stand? No, I think I can, yeah, yeah, can sit here. Um, so one, one uh, and you already mentioned a lot of these things, but I want to, since I read the book, or rather I listened to the book, as I told you, um, I, the book provides also a lot of like very specific and detailed evidence to all, all of these more uh, political philosophy points that you um, today presented us. And one of those chapters that left me with like, biggest food for thought or impression was the one where you critique the good guy with a gun doctrine or what you call the myth of law abiding citizen or the sanctity of it that you mentioned today in the talk. You specifically say that it is not only not the solution, as some people say, but it is it is the problem. So can you maybe elaborate on that? Because in, in the book, you have some like pretty eye opening uh, specific details that people who have like, I don't remember what, what year was that, but have um, maybe concealed carry permits that they are more likely to engage with the victimizer than to help the victim. Um, yeah. And like you talk about this whole, how what, what happens when we separate society into sheep and wolves and sheep, sheep dogs. Yes, more yeah. about sheep dogs, yeah. please. Yeah, thank you. Um, I think the first thing is at the practical level of why legislation has been impossible, because when people talk about gun control, the defense of the gun community, particularly the NRA, has been, oh, well, that's just to punish the righteous, that's to infringe the rights of the law-abiding citizen, as if they're completely separate people. So there is the sort of the barrier to legislation um, that, that, that people won't vote on it because they see the world in those terms. So that's the smaller side of it, or the less controversial side of what I'm saying. The harder medicine, in a way, is the observation made by, and I quote those studies, it's a Harvard study on road rage, you know, having a gun in your glove compartment is, is an indicator of a road rage and other kinds of aggression. Um, is it Matthew Miller and David Hemingway? Um, and these the evidence that you know, when, when concealed permits were allowed in Florida, road rage incidents increased and they decided to slow it, you know, the speed limit um, to try to address it that way rather than address the guns. So there is this, there's a lot of anecdotal evidence and there is data. But the harder message I was trying to make was through these psychologists, Rollo May, who wrote a book, um, Power and Innocence, and Hans Tock, who builds on that with, um, well, he, it, it's a connected argument his book, Violent Men, has these different types of um, violent offenders, and one of them is the norm enforcer. 
And what Toc and Rollo May say is that there's a paradox in America that violence is linked to virtue or a self-perception of virtue, that these are, are, the, are America's vigilantes and, and they feel that they're defending maidens and um, carrying off dragons. And um, it, it's very similar to, you might know Graham Greene's book, The Quiet American, where he says, I have never knew a man who had better reasons for all the harm he caused in the world. He recognizes that his character, Pyle, um, is a good man in many ways. He's a decent person, but his violence almost springs from his sense of righteousness. Um, and the, you know, some of the incidents I describe are of people who are either NRA members or people who have written very passionately about the need to arm law-abiding citizens. And, and that is clearly no barrier to to, to being violent and, and to breaking the law. I mean, Stroud uses, you know, talks about how they're so confident that they belong to a different class that they will just break the law and carry their guns in places where they're explicitly prohibited. So there's this weird sort of lawlessness built into the idea of the law-abiding citizen. Yeah, thank you. Um, the other thing is uh, you you mentioned a little bit about the Heller decision, and I think in, in the book it has, it plays such a central role, like, most of our history, we've been thinking about this right to, to arms as a collective, and now suddenly it became individual. And you you frame it, you kind of you focus on Scalia's um, comments, where saying that he he turned people into person and militia into metaphor, uh, and instead of this kind of fine nuanced historical context that you provided us with today, he, pro he, he focused on, on these dictionary definitions of the terms. So can you say maybe a little bit more about that and how significant was it? And is there, is there a way to reinterpret it after this <coughs> dictionary yeah. definitions? Yeah, I, mean, I would love to, to believe there is. I mean, there has to be. That's in Michael Waldman's book um, on the Second Amendment. I mean, <laughs> It, it, it's so depressing to read how you know, he charts a similar narrative of the unraveling of this collective view of the Second Amendment towards this individualistic view in the late 20th century and how it seems ridiculous and then it gets traction. And the best thing in the entire book is where he says, this will not be the last time the Supreme Court rules on the Second Amendment. Now, unfortunately, since Heller in 2008, we've had a new phase of authorizing guns outside the home, in the Bruin decision of, of 22, and we're now, we hold our breath to see what they decide about bump stocks. And um, we've entered a strange realm, but um, what I hope is, it's almost so bad, I mean, this sounds flippant, but it's almost so bad that it's good because the methodology in Heller is literally using dictionaries, is to, you have a coherent phrase about the right of the people to keep and bear arms, and it's con clearly connected to the militia and clearly anchored to the security of the state. And there's a long history. There's a prehistory of it. There's the actual history of the Second Amendment and how, how, and how the courts have interpreted it. He dismantles that. And the method is to break it up. He never really addresses the sentence as a whole. He takes individual words and say, well, you know, what's an arm? Uh, look it up in a dictionary and it says it's a weapon. What's to keep? What is to possess? What's to, to bear? It's to carry. Oh, ergo, it must mean it's a right to keep, you know, to, to hold a weapon on your person. There was an old meme, really, where a NRA-funded scholar found this phrase in the dictionary that referred to wearing arms in a coat. And said, well, that obviously means that people carried guns on their person, even though revolvers hadn't been invented. And Gary Wills did the research, and it might have been based on someone else in his 1995 article in the New York Review of Books, and he says, this is the kind of blunder. Bearing arms in a coat is a re reference to heraldry. You know, you have a coat of arms. It's nothing to do with um, carrying weapons on your person. But that's the level of the Heller decision. I found, if I, if I could just share this anecdote. I mean, this is on the day I took US citizenship and in the dark days of COVID, and so no one else could come. And it was, so it was already a bit downbeat. I was chasing up this reference from a 19, 1842, 1843 ruling, State v. Huntley, which addresses the, the menace of guns in society in very strident terms. And it also says that the fact that you have a right to bear arms in defense of the state doesn't give you a right to, to, to carry one for your personal purposes. In fact, it deepens your guilt if you abuse that high privilege um, to threaten other people. 
I thought, well, why is no one quoting this? So I start going through all my notes and searching everything. The reason I didn't have it was because it was misquoted in Hella, uh, misspelled. So I, just, I, I Google the reference. You know, I find the misspelling and the page references, and it takes me straight to the NRA website and an amicus brief submitted by georgiacarry.org, which just, but both the amicus brief and Hella, in my opinion, <laughs> misrepresent this case. And I'm going to my oath ceremony thinking, do people realize that the gun lobby is writing their federal law, their constitutional law? I mean, it would seem a bizarre coincidence. So the Heller thing is, you know, I, Patrick Charles I mentioned earlier, and he's written this book, Vote Gun, which I'd recommend, very good on the 70s and 80s. But he said, if you think that's bad, just go through the footnotes of Bruin, you know, the, the, the decision two years ago. We are dealing with sort of cut and paste, and it's not a serious intellectual exercise. So I, I hope and pray that something's going to change. I, I, I wasn't going to say thoughts and prayers, but... Um, something will change. And then at the citizenship ceremony, you, you took the oath and say you will bear the arms on behalf well, of the United States. <laughs> well, I didn't. I mean, I, I, I was told by um, friends, immigrant lawyers, not to engage that subject because if you say, if you tick the box, you don't want to bear arms, then they'll pull you aside for all sorts of interviews. If I ticked it and they said, fine, um, but they, get, they still gave me the oath with the bearing arms. So I felt a bit uncatered for that. But anyway, yeah. <laughs> I'm still thinking about it because I was in the same boat like a month ago when I took my oath. Uh, oh, so really? okay. one more question and then we'll, we'll, we'll open the floor. You um, very briefly, and today you didn't really speak about that, but at the, in the book towards the end, you kind of say that the public health messaging is not effective because guns are not the same as cigarettes and they're not the same as automobiles and that they are kind of much more fundamental to who we are as a society and that we we need to talk about the meaning of freedom and liberty and what the founding fathers intended, as, as you mentioned today, the, the architects of the liberal state. So um, how, how do we really start? The, the title of your talk was The Shape yeah. of Hope. So what is the shape or how do we shape it? Yeah. OK, so I mean, I think one version of this that I wrote a couple of days ago was much more trying to bring out the work of, you know, March for Our Lives and Moms Demand Action and, and talk about those in the way E.P. Thompson talked about all this sort of groundswell of dissent in the USSR and in, and this side of the uh, you know, Iron Curtain. Um, I think that it's a multi, it's a, it, there, there are many contributors. I'm not suggesting, you know, my con contribution here is to try to extol the ideas of liberty as a kind of conditional thing and as a a thing involving mutual trust and obligation. Um, there is a grassroots activism that's, that, that's working um, in a totally different area. And I think that I would see them both within that ferment of impatience with what we're suffering and, um, you know, a desire to act. I don't, I don't think, um, you know, I don't think the intellectual argument with the courts is going to take an awful long time, as we can see. The public health argument, I think it's still really important material. That, 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 um, those articles I was quoting about road rage, you know, they're based on hard empirical data, and I absolutely applaud that. I just think that in terms of the public narrative, it does concede too much if we sort of soften or neutralize the discourse where you're just talking about it as a, almost as a positive thing. You know, Joanna Burke's book, Deep Violence on Militarism and Culture, worries about statements of standards for war or expectations of, uh, of military conduct, sometimes they end up creating even more violence because they kind of legitimize the project. That's my worry with some of the discourse, but I, I don't want to criticize the public health argument. I think it's just what we need is for it to be complemented by a, a sharper edged um, intellectual argument about liberty. And I think this is what Jonathan Metzl, I don't know if you've seen his book, um, Jonathan Metzl's book, What We've Become, seems to be making that argument. So um, I'd like to think there's a body of us coming at it with our different skills. Yeah. Um, well, thank you very much, um, the audience. If somebody has a question, please come up to the microphone uh, because we are recording and live streaming this. And uh, if you could introduce yourself before you ask the question. Anybody want to come up, Pete? 
Hi. So first of all, thank you very much. It's a very interesting talk. And um, very nice to hear things contextualized historically and philosophically. Um, my name is Pete Bilderback. I'm uh, the communications uh, and outreach and writer here at Watson. Um, I also, for eight years, served on the uh, board of directors of a group called the Rhode Island Coalition Against Gun Violence. And um, <clears throat> I guess one of the things that I want to kind of respond to in your work, and I apologize if I seem defensive because <laughs> I put eight years of, of heart and soul into the work that we were doing. Um, when the coalition formed in 2013 in the wake of Sandy Hook, we did make a strategic decision to address gun violence as a public health issue. Yeah. Um, and I think, you know, the, the big takeaway that I got from, from all of it is what hard work it all is. Um, we start, as I said, we started in 2000. 13, we didn't get our first bill passed until um, 2017. Mm -hmm. It was four years of soul-crushing defeats. Um, and this was in a blue state um, in, with a legislature that had virtually no Republicans. Mm -hmm. um, I was uh, actually ridiculed by the chair of the Judiciary Committee for having the audacity to suggest that we shouldn't have concealed carry in our K through 12 schools in Rhode Island. Wow. So, you know, the, I, I'm afraid that, you know, if I had started with a more totalizing argument, yeah. and, and I very much agree with everything yeah. that, that you have to say on that, that it would have been very difficult to get anything done. It was already very difficult to get anything done. But in 2017, we did finally get a law passed that um, uh, took guns away from people who were convicted domestic abusers. Um, we later got a red flag law passed, a uh, ban on ghost guns. <laughs> finally, in 2021, after we got a new Speaker of the House, we managed to um, ban concealed carry in schools and also ban straw purchases. These are things yeah. that you would think, this is all low-hanging fruit, right? Yeah. It was not. Yeah. <laughs> it truly was not. Um, last year, um, and I see that Melissa Cardin is here. She's the executive director of the coalition. Um, the coalition passed a ban on large capacity magazines, which I viewed as kind of the first yeah. really powerful piece of legislation that pushes back against the pro-gun narrative. Um, this year, uh, I know the coalition is working on a ban on assault weapons, which I hope will be successful. But, you know, I think, um, well, you know, I, I really, you know, very much agree with everything that, that you had to say, I guess what I would emphasize is just that like on the ground, yeah. it's really hard work. Yeah, I, I really appreciate that comment. And I think, as you say, you know, it is really important work. And you know, you know, I'm talking in the sort of more poetic terms about the civil rights movement, but if you read those kind of big histories by Taylor Branch, you know, three, and it's a trilogy and the, the the gritty detail and the law, you know, the the number of times bail has to be posted and and the the grinding kind of legalities of it. And we have this image of the speeches. And um, so, yeah, I certainly don't want to undermine that. I think that, and also, I think that they're very significant in themselves. These um, these steps and they're hugely symbolic, as you say. It's the kind of you know the the, the large capacity magazine thing would be is huge symbolically and just in terms of stopping you know arresting the the, the process because in my state they, they've almost stripped everything away and then now they're passing laws to give tax holidays for guns for for, for gun sellers for certain days of the year because we have to do something <laughs> it is relentless so just to stop that is very important i think what i was trying to get at in terms of against the public health thing is 
to keep in mind that these are deadly weapons and it is unusual. You know, I've, I've used this example, I embarrassed my daughter, you know, she rings me up and she's on the train saying, Daddy, there's someone with a gun, a human gun. You know, that, and then she later explained that, that meant a handgun as opposed to something you might, you know, hunt with. And I feel if somehow we could recover that sense of shock and, you know, imagine if owning a handgun were as unacceptable as, as making a racial slur in public. You know, imagine if a generation just made that decision, then, you know, the gun sellers would be in trouble almost instantly. And imagine how that could cascade into something larger. So I suppose it's just, to me, it's about, it's almost an aesthetic argument. And when I, you know, I see a gun in, in Georgia, which is not infrequently, uh, I'm aware of that history and I have a revulsion to it in a way that others don't. And um, I suppose this is one strand. I certainly don't want to discredit the public health approach, but yeah, thanks. Yeah, really thank you very much. Yes. Sorry, long answers from me. <laughs> no, thank you. Um, thank you for your talk. Um, my name is Paul, and I wanted to kind of echo what the previous commenter said, and I think maybe you summarized it yourself uh, in one of the moderator's questions, saying that what you're calling for is a more, um, <clears throat> a sharper intellectual engagement with um, these pro-gun arguments. And I just wonder if your um, not taking substantial enough the degree to which this is not just a flaw in our system, but a flaw in our people, um, that this is a broadly popular um, problem. There is a lot of popular support for the legal status quo that we have. And if you trace a turn back to the Reagan administration, which I agree with, there's definitely been um, a sort of success in marketing by the gun companies in terms of convincing people to buy more guns, but um, they have also been making inroads more recently into um, what they perceive as neglected markets, so non-whites, women, and that's where their sales growth is coming from. And yep. every election of a Democratic president is inevitably um, preceded by, accompanied by, a spike in sales of um, you know weapons of all kinds. So, I I want there to be change. I guess I feel like the change isn't going to come without a change in what we, as a populace, want, desire, mm -hmm. see as our interests. And you know this is uh, you know uh, a commonly trotted out punching bag, and I don't mean to be dismissive, but. <sighs> Certainly, this doesn't seem like a moment in our history where um, you know people from above, whether they're newspaper editorial writers or doctors or academics, can say to the people, "This isn't working for you," and the people say, "Yes, that is a wise opinion. We will follow." You know, elites. Yeah. Totally. I mean, I, I, I agree, I, and I think I'd come back to the point that we need. A multi-pronged approach and I think that where something is so explicit in its appeal to the elites called the founding fathers I try not to use that phrase in the book it, it's fair game to, 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 to challenge them toe to toe and I say in my conclusion I'm not an originalist I don't want to just imply that there's this sort of special generation whose voice must um, transcend all others but since that's the the, 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 the terrain the game is being played on we, we have to engage it I I think that the slavery, um, the arguments about slavery, and they're so clear in someone like Solomon Northup's book, I think they start to make that aesthetic argument that guns are ugly. They have an ugly history. And that doesn't, you know, are you, I might be an elite, <laughs> be, be guilty of that charge standing here, but um, I think to read the history at first hand and to see how intimately it's, it, it's tied in with the racial politics of the country, the era of Roosevelt, there's now a new reckoning about U.S. imperialism. Um, I think that that could be really a, a popular argument that, that, that would be on the you know the level with things like the 1619 project. Um, I also think you know I take your point that it's a widespread thing, but you know I, I started with E.P. Thompson because I love the way he just calls out the fragility of the Cold War consensus. It's just look under the lid and you find that it fades quite quickly. You know I know a lot of gun owners, and. You know, they, they push back and, and we argue, but they would not want to be felons. You know, they're not people who would 
defy laws that made it illegal to carry guns in public. I don't think that that level of it. The number of people who will go that step, I think, is quite small. And I had this experience of reading side by side the American <coughs> Rifleman on the one side and then the masses edited by Max Eastman in the First World War on the other. And the masses it just had all these extraordinary um, range of contributors and there's just an energy and a vitality about it. The American Rifleman has been saying the same thing for almost 100 years now. And I think it is, while it's a very virulent culture, I think it, it's, it's not really a culture of individualism and free. I don't think you have to change so many minds, is what I'm saying. I think if the change came at the top, and I think if there were a, there were a change you know, in the Republican Party, um, I think it would, it would, the domino effect would be fairly rapid. But I'll stop there. Thank you. So um, what I want to do is allow people, do you want to ask a question? Yeah, we're going to take a last question, and then we'll have an opportunity if you wanted to purchase the book and to speak with the author, and then we think we have a reception outside. <laughs> Thank you so much. It was fascinating and sobering. And I just sat here, keep, and I kept thinking, why would you choose to live here, and particularly in Georgia? <laughs> <laughs> it's a question I've asked myself. There was, there was a story told by Robert Barclay, the Quaker apologist, and he described a, um, a Quaker evangelist at Bristol in England giving such a, a powerful speech in favor of the new world and life in Pennsylvania that a young guy just jumped on the boat, didn't even say goodbye to his family, went. And I feel like my wife is a, you know, works at CNN. I was teaching at King's College London. Um, loved my job, loved my students. Um, I didn't have very much time to do research and also being married. Um, she was offered a big job in um, in Atlanta, and I think we just made the decision in about 10 minutes. And, you know, a friend of mine was offered a job informally at Vanderbilt, and he sort of weighed the pros and cons and decided it wasn't for him. And I just thought, I want to be the person who doesn't sit around and deliberate. <laughs> he just goes and thinks about it afterwards. There have been times where I really have despaired, but I have learned to, just like I've done in the book, is to separate uh, the gun culture from America, and I know these two things merge, and it's not a perfect separation, but the America I know is not defined by guns. Um, it's something that affects me on a daily basis, you know, on a daily basis because I've chosen to study it, and I didn't, wouldn't want to bury my head in the sand, but I think that, you know, there is still more energy, getting back to that word hope, there is more vitality in this country intellectually than there probably is back home in this post-Brexit Britain, but it's it, it's a fair question. But um, as my wife always says, America is a more interesting country. <laughs> and on that on that note, uh, we'll thank you very much for a fascinating conversation. Thank you.